Great, good, excellent, there we go. Good, well, welcome everybody, good evening. Uh, well, we're in for a treat tonight. I've been really looking forward to this and I know a lot of you have as well. Um, we've got the wonderful Julia Robertson joining us. Hi, Julia. Hi, Andrew. It's really good. Thank you so much. I've been very much looking forward to this too. So thank you so much for inviting me on. Well, it's great. I, you know, I know, um, you know, I, I should start really by congratulating you on your new role with CAM, Canine Arthritis Management, as an expert advisor. That's it was. Yeah, it was wonderful to be invited. It's such an honor. And I, I well, I've known Hannah for quite a long time and watched every inch of CAM developing. So it's just wonderful to be part of it from from that perspective. And as we'll we'll find out as, as we have a chat tonight, as, as, mm. you, as you share with us, um, uh, a lot of the things that CAM has adopted over time have been very much influenced from from you and Galen my therapy so I think that's yeah. that's a lovely synergy isn't it I think yeah it really is together. and and what they've done with that information is amazing they've really mm. made it mainstream um which is fantastic and it's you know if, Hannah if you're listening I think we can both say you know what what a what a kind of uh, a force of nature and what an inspiration <laughs> to get stuff done because yeah. It takes a lot to get stuff done. You've done the same, of course, yeah. Julia. So, um, so we'll come on to that in a little bit because that'll be very much part of the what you've got for us. And and you've very kindly got a bit of a presentation for us uh, tonight to go through some things for us. I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, and also, I just wanted to say, Julia, you know, I, I get to talk to some wonderful people. Uh, we've got about seventy chats now in the Dog Center Care YouTube channel, mm. and I've tried to curate those through the kind of the lived experience of dogs, you know, all the different yeah. aspects that people can draw on it. But I'm always fascinated by people's origin stories. And we, I'd yeah. like to share yours with us in a moment. But two things come up in these stories when people share how they start to see things differently. One is having that dog or that horse or that yeah. you know, animal yeah. that really made you think about things. Yeah. But also there's people that influence them. And your name comes up a lot, Julia. So, oh, uh, you know, I don't really know nice. you live on telly, but, uh, really but nice. and, and also Gail and my therapy. How many people really point to that as an influence? That's great. That's so lovely to hear. And, you know, we're all so busy working, aren't we? And it's really lovely to actually hear that nice things are being said while you're busy trying to make a bit of a difference and uh, just sort of keep going, really. <laughs> Well, you definitely made a difference. And I say the ripples, you know, we, we never really fully understand or can comprehend how far those ripples go sometimes. No, you know? no, no. We, we do hear, we do, I do get, I do get some strange feedback that seems to go round and round and round and then comes back, which is, which is wonderful to hear. Uh, so let's hear a bit about Julia before we come on to uh, learning a bit more about Galen. How, what is your story, Julia? How, how did, did those seeds get sown for you? Well, honestly, I, I don't know. I don't know how these things happen, but I definitely came out of the womb loving animals. And none of my family come from an animal, a very animal dominated background at all. But I think I came out looking at dogs and horses and knowing that that was my life. Um, but it wasn't until later. I mean, I've always worked within animals and with animals. So I was a, a veterinary nurse way before there were any qualifications and things for veterinary nursing. And that dates me, I think. I, and that was that was a fantastic experience, too. But I think really the one thing I've I think I've always been able to do or always have been. And I think you're the same is a great observer. And I didn't realize I was until a few people have said, well, actually, you you really can see things. And I think it's that the love then being able to observe and take the time to observe and then be able to almost formulate patterns within those observations. Um, that has been one of the main foundations of Garland, really. And then the science comes and backs it up, which is always that exciting moment. Um, so I suppose the love of animals has always been there. Um, what's so interesting is that um, my two children are, are also very much animal lovers, but my granddaughter is just, again, obsessed. She's only two and her first word was horse and dog. So okay. <laughs> it's, really, it's sort of, yes, Garland will continue. It's very exciting. 
So it's very interesting where these origins come from and what ends up driving you and giving you that deep fulfillment. Um, I don't know where it comes from, but I'm very pleased I have it. Well, the force is strong with you and your family, <laughs> clearly. Um, uh, hello. Oh, we've got an Afghan hound coming in. Oh, <laughs> oh, the oh yes. There you go. Nice to see you. Oh, I've got, <laughs> I've got a Labrador. Can't be outdone here. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. I've got a couple of those here somewhere as well. So um, they like to come and have a little a little stroke. So the, I think the observation thing is really important, isn't it? And I think, mm. uh, and also the, the kind of be, being, a, a, being allowing ourselves to be, to feel deeply and to think deeply yeah. and to think, well, oh, that's interesting. That's that's kind of the fifth time I've seen that. Maybe that's exactly thing. exactly. And one of the things is we we undervalue the anecdotal sometimes and the subjective, yeah, yeah because that's absolutely. where we start to come up with some of these things. Yeah, exactly. And I think one of the the biggest um, observations has been the positive pact, the choice led treatment, which has evolved over years since I started and now obviously culminated within a whole protocol. But what's so interesting about that is that I've been very, very lucky um, to have been invited to many different countries around the world and many different cultures around the world. And do you know what? Dogs behave the same way everywhere you go. They do the same thing, which has always blown my mind slightly because I always thought, well, maybe I'm influencing it somehow. But no, they behave in exactly the same way. Um, and that is incredible. It's almost like a choice led manual that the dog reads and goes, oh, yes, I meant to behave like this, this, this and this. And this is what I do. And that has been a real thrill, a real thrill. And it's it's sometimes um, if people don't understand the nuances, it's almost like one of these classic Disney films where everyone can see different levels of the same film. And looking at those little nuances and reading those nuances and seeing them repeated time and time again, it's there is some huge thrill to that, isn't there? There is usually, and I, and I think um, when we get a peek into the experience of another, mm. I think it's a wonderful yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Do you and have a back... hmm. sorry, sorry, go I was on. Just gonna say, do you have a background? Uh, you know, when you were young, do you have an interest in mathematics or sciences or anything like that? No, <laughs> no. Um, sadly not. Mathematics, no, absolutely not. I've always been very practical. Um Sciences, yes, but only the biology is not none of the, the, the I don't think I could even spell physics, quite frankly. Um, so I, I, like so many people, wanted to be a vet, but academically, that was never something on my horizon at all. But I have to say, with all honesty, since I've been doing um, working with Garland and working um, with dogs from this perspective, I have not had that old wish back. I'm so thrilled to be working on the level that I am, which is which is great. But no, sadly, anything like that wasn't wasn't open to me. I didn't quite have that sort of that type of brain. But interestingly, my daughter's a doctor, so it's out there somewhere. No, that's not. I only asked because whether there was um kind of an analytical framework inside that was that was seeking to join dots. I mean, but it does maybe. sound like you were kind of, it was your um, love, your innate love for animals and your yeah. desire and your passion about observing them and, and, sh and holding space with them. I think That's it's, yes, and, and believing what you see. Um, but yeah, I mm. think observation, I was always taught to just watch. And I know another great um, educator, Turid Rugas, of course, is a great observer. So whenever we get together, there's a lot of looking and mm. and observing from two different perspectives. And that's what I find incredibly validating, working with someone like her that is looking at the same scene, but from a different perspective. And mm. both of us find that very validating that we see the same, but I see it from a physical and she sees it from a psychological perspective, but we're still seeing the same thing and becoming or coming with the same sort of conclusions. So that's that's pretty cool. And as I said, highly validating. Very cool. And um, uh, 
And we don't do enough of it, do we? I think I think there's a profession more generally just talking about dog training and behavior. Uh, we don't get enough education on just being present enough to do good observations and what that looks exactly. like, because often we're already turning up with a pre prescribed outlook about what we're going to do. Exactly. Um, Exactly. I mean, I've got many, many anecdotes of, and of course, the biggest thrill, I mean, I, I, my work is so fulfilling for me, it's wonderful. But watching students change and seeing them suddenly work with a dog, not, not and work on such a level with them, that it's like you take on a whole different zone. And they all reach that at different points of their training or case studies or whatever. But once they reach that, that is something that you will never forget. So you're then working with on the same level as that dog. And that is phenomenal, too. It is. And I think, uh, you know, <clears throat> when I first started the, the group, the Dog Center Care mm -hmm. group, the whole point really was to, to have a platform to bring all these amazing voices in, really, mm -hmm. because... And some of them, like you say, yourself and um, and Turid and Sheila Harper and you know, Sarah Fisher and many others, um, I've been talking about this for a long time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but um, uh, Sheila uh, said to me once, you know, it, it felt like tumbleweed sometimes because it, it just there wasn't the response. And but I think exactly. it's great that people are connecting now and, and seeing what more might look like. Exactly, exactly. And, and it is lovely. And you need you need the things to be joined up and these little conduits of people to join up. And, and I think also come at it from different directions. This is why working with other professionals in a multimodal team is so important. Because we, we, we I'm, I mean, I know I get very blinkered with how I see things, not intentionally, but because of the passion, that's what I see. And I need other people to see from another perspective to actually get more of a whole story. And again, this is why it's so great to talk to you and everyone within the group, because they all have different ways of looking and working. And the more we can share and the more we can work together and share our experiences and share our knowledge, not our old knowledge, share our new knowledge, that that is when we're all going to make a difference to dogs' lives and animals' lives too. Oh, that's really powerful. We said there, and I amen to that for sure. Because you know what, we're, the big shift for me—it's a little shift, but it's a big one, really—is is the notion of thinking about that individual animal, that individual yes. lived experience, and recognizing that all of our lived experiences are are unique to us, actually. And uh, mm -hmm. so, being available to others, so we get we need many voices, uh, and it is how our individual interpretations, and to be humble enough to think. Do you know, this is what I see. This is what I feel. But mm. also, I need to hear you. And what do you think? Yeah. And what do you feel? Because ultimately, we're trying to connect to these wonderful animals that share our space with us. Exactly. Exactly. And they've got so much more that they that we haven't yet quite understood. Um, mm. So much more. And that's another reason why I just love what I we do so much because. We've we've got so much more to learn, so much more to learn. And that's exciting. It is. It also feels a bit overwhelming sometimes as well. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. <laughs> and it's a bit, there. I'm gonna take I'm gonna take a rest next week. Oh no, 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 I've got that to do. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I've just come back from a three-day conference with Amber Batson. Uh, oh, have you? So Brilliant. talk about <laughs> frying some brain cells when you're with Amber yeah. for, for a few days. Uh, but yeah, so I think the most important thing is that we, we need to listen to these things and we need to take it on for ourselves and think, what does this mean for me? You know, what does this yeah. mean for me and, and how I how I need to interact and and how I can be more available really to the dogs you know, around me Very or much. horses or whatever. Very much. Absolutely. Well, let's move the focus then onto onto hmm. Galen, my therapy. And uh, I think okay. it's be a good time for us to get the um get the get your presentation up okay i'm gonna go and open the door for the afghan because i think that's what, okay. <laughs> what reese is telling me now he's saying come on let me out let me get let me go and right go shall and i shall i go. share screen then is that yeah you share screen i'm yep. just gonna let uh, reese okay <laughs> right hopefully everyone can oh, see yeah. the there first slide oh afghan hound still oh afghan oh. hound is outside excellent oh. 
all three of them now, actually. All right. <laughs> it's such That's a lovely fun. evening. Why not? Um, you were talking about the dog um, that started everything. And, and this is my dog that started everything. And that was back in 1995. And, and actually, the picture there is of him when he was, I mean, he was 17 um, when he did die. But I, I've made this story quite available. So people, a lot of people know the story that when he was six months, he basically suffered an injury. And I wasn't aware of what the injury was, because in fact, we were away um, when it happened and he couldn't lift his head from the ground and cut a very long story short I was told uh, he had to be put to sleep um, but what it transpired to be was actually a soft tissue injury um, and so I once I realized that it was something more soft tissue and always having musculoskeletal problems all my life because I've got I got a, a scoliosis of the spine and I think that's been really helpful for my own learning and empathy um, to understand how important it is to keep the myofascial connections as balanced as possible. So when I was told he had, um, it was actually a neck problem, I just started doing some very simple exercises and he responded incredibly quickly. So having been told at six months he had to be put to sleep, he actually went on to live a very, very full life until he was 17. So here's my dog and I, that really that's what started the nightmares for me actually realizing that there were dogs that had back problems neck problems that were potentially being put to sleep because the drugs then especially and and the diagnostics then um were didn't touch things like that they they had made no impact on it at all and of course not many drugs have a big effect on any muscle pain so that was when I thought how many dogs have been put to sleep from having a bad back and I get a bad back but I didn't want to die um so this was way back and you can see him there as quite a young dog but it was interesting because I was very very lucky um to be invited to talk at one of Shirag Patel's huge conferences pre-COVID which was just the most fun and there were a big big audience and I actually said to them okay everyone in this audience Everyone put your hands up who are here because of one dog that started your journey. And it's practically the whole audience. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. And I'm sure today would be the same. Now, way back in 2004. So it started. I started treating in 2002 and it was quite an interesting start because there were no no one else I could find that was doing anything like what I was doing. No hands on work at all. There were no physios that I could find. There were chiropractors, but very, very few. And most of them working with horses, not dogs. And this little girl came in, Rafiki, and she was only mm, four years old at this stage and was obviously, you can see the posture here was not good. And incredibly, after one treatment, she changed from that shape and posture to that. And which blew my mind. And I can't believe that I actually took a picture because I'm terrible at taking pictures. You can't see very clearly. But the thing that really I love so much is the look of her face from there to there. Now, she, too, went on to live to 17 years. But at this point, she wasn't looking good at all. And she was on a lot of drugs. So this this dog was pivotal for me and my learning and the development of Garland, because that made me realize the importance of looking at posture, studying posture, and also putting that in connection, not just with individual muscles, but the whole fascial connection. So she, she is very much in Garland's history. She really is from that perspective and many others. Now this little dog, Fifi, she was called Princess Fifi because her behavior was shocking poor little girl was a breeding bitch um she actually came from the states and um was crated for quite long periods of time and you could see by her posture she was not a comfortable girl she didn't like people she didn't like other dogs she, didn't, she couldn't walk particularly well but her behavior was pretty shocking um from a sort of living with perspective and again this is after three treatments and you can see her posture is very different, but the big thing, and this is where my, my beginnings of linking a 
different and specific behaviors with posture and discomfort, she really just, everything just came together with her. She was chewing her feet, licking her feet. She was grumpy. She was um, possessive. She was, she didn't want to share her space with anyone. She didn't like to be touched. At this point, all of that changed. Every bit of it, she stopped licking and chewing her feet. She loved people. She sat on people's lap. The whole thing changed. Very basic now because we've taken great roads forwards. But this, she, for me, was the big behavioral discomfort and behavior change. And not sort of change, but validation. I'll use that word again. Mm. So, again, an amazing dog for that. Now, I just thought a very brief timeline because these are some of the things that really stand out in my mind as some things that we have done that are really exciting and after a lot of work have culminated towards that. I mean, first of all, it's the diploma itself, the accreditation, which actually came to life in 2006. And if anyone's ever put an accredited program, training program together, you know that that is sort of, you know, blood, sweat and tears and an awful lot of everything, especially the tears. Um, but then my book, that my first book that I wrote, the reason I put this up there is because at this point, I put fascia in and also posture. My first um, understanding and tried to categorize postures too, um, which we as an organization have really taken on and taken on both of those aspects, looking at the myofascial um, chains, movement, connections, along with very now detailed um, postural assessments. And this is where we put our observational document together too, around the 2015 mark. And that was, and I'll, I'll speak about this um, incredible guy a bit later, was when I was invited up to the University of Lincoln to um, meet up with um, Daniel Mills, who I was so nervous because he invited me because I talked to him. I said, I sent an email saying, I've, I've seen these connections. Um, what do you think? Are these interesting? Are they of, of interest to you? And he said, come up and see us. <gasps> so um, had a fantastic trip. And that again was very validating. And of course, he's just taken it on. To, so we understand it much, much more. So this is our own comfort scale, um, which is something again that we've we've developed through observations and um, many 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 hundreds and hundreds of dogs and how they present and then how they change after the treatment so we get some fantastic results looking at that it's nice to have something to measure isn't it then i think one thing that um this the distance support program which um i know we were talking about a little bit earlier um, is something that I just love. I really, really do. Um, this came about, um, and it sounds like I'm dropping names as in countries, but I was in Taiwan and I was actually invited to speak at one of their, I think it was the first dog symposium um, out, out there. Um, I must say I've met some incredible people with such drive and passion. And it's, a, it's so humbling to work with these people. It really, really is. And this is one of those times and I was giving my talk about recognizing discomfort in dogs and this and that and how to recognize it in your dog. And, and then afterwards, I had a lot of people come up to talk to me and they said to me, my dog shows every single every single facet of what you've just, dis what you've just dis um, discussed, what can I do? And I just looked at this particular girl and just, I didn't know what to say. And I felt that is so irresponsible of me to be out there saying, well, this is what you recognize, but not actually giving people in Taiwan or anywhere else any solutions because we didn't we've got therapists out there now but at the time we didn't and I just felt awful absolutely awful so I asked her to email me and we started a correspondence and I started to help her in a way that I could and I thought no this isn't good enough if I'm lucky enough to be talking 
and highlighting things. I've got to put something together that can help people treat their own dogs. So our distance support program is something that I'm very proud of and um, has really shown some amazing changes. But what I really love about it is that it gives the guardians, the caregivers, the owners, whatever you want to call these wonderful people that want to help their dogs, the skills to be able to help their own dog. And that is just fantastic. And then they start to get to know them on another level and a different relationship forms. And that is fantastic. That's a real moment for all of us. It really is. Then I've left Positive Pact for the end. I, I suppose this culminated within a scientific discussion paper, the last of all. It's been growing ever since day one, um, but it's fantastic to have every different nuance of our choice-led treatment to be substantiated by, by the science. Um, and as I pertained to earlier, this, this, this choice-led treatment is wonderful and I love it and it really works. The dogs love it. Sometimes it takes them a little bit longer if dogs don't know what autonomy is, sometimes they take it take a little bit longer to really believe that they have that choice. But it is a phenomenal thing. It really is. And it works so well. And it's very specific to how we all treat. So I thought I would also just sort of mention some of the things that we were the first to talk about and and slippery floors, I know that's something that Cam has really run with, which is fantastic. But we were the first to ever talk about slippery floors and also repetitive strains like jumping from cars and chasing balls, which I still see a lot now. Um, but these things are now talked about. And I know I was speaking to a vet a while ago and he said that as far as he is concerned, every vet that he speaks to talks about trying to stop people allowing their dogs to jump in and out of the cars, which is, is pretty amazing, really, that it's sort of permeated through um, all different all different professional and non-professional channels. Um, I thought I'd come back because we all like a picture of a dog. And uh, these are just three very recent distance support dogs. And I just want to show you the befores and the afters of these dogs. Now, we look at dogs in every type of situation because when we're doing rehab, we look at functional movements. So what movements should the dog be able to do? And this in particular, I know that one of them, he, uh, she rather, this is a, a girl, is actually having a dump and the other one she's having a pee, but she's still having to crouch and perform that two or three times a day. And the dogs that have... Um, sore back, sore legs, unstable legs, sore necks, shoulders, whatever. This is a really uncomfortable thing for them to do. So that too can set up potentially other issues. So if you look at how she was before and then how she, how much more comfortable she is. So she's going to be more encouraged to wee or to have a dump. And that is so important. And this little dog here has actually got um, uh, one of her foot, one of her feet is um, um, deformed, always has been. Um, but look at the posture, even with that deformed foot before and after. And these dogs are all being treated super, um, supported by us, but treated by their own guardians. And this one, too. I mean, it sort of looks like a different dog. I think the scale's a bit out, but. Look at the top line, look at the legs, they're all very much more balanced. So if the body's balanced, the body can function much better, not just the external, but the internal too. So um, I just wanted to share those distance support programs. So, ah, some of the people I've met, gosh, am I lucky, I really am. And I'm, I'm going to say it all started with this DVD that I put together with a colleague way back in 2009, 10, um, all about movement, because like a lot of us were fascinated with how, how all, all of us move, but of course how dogs move. And this, I, I don't know how this happened. I really don't, but it won the, the Dog Writers Association of, of America 
um, the, the DVD prize in 2012, which I didn't, I didn't put it in. I don't know who entered it, entered it in the competition. And then I had this amazing woman email me and say, sort of along the lines, I always win that. Why did you win it? <laughs> As you've won it, you better come and talk at my symposium. And uh, of course, when I saw it, I couldn't believe it. I thought someone was pranking me that Turid Rugas had emailed me. But um, anyway, she very kindly asked me along to the symposium, her own symposium in Oslo, which of course I was terrified. I had the most amazing time. We really just connected. And um, she then invited me to go and teach, co-teach with her in the States. I mean, in fact, we did this quite a lot of places around the world. But I went to the States and that was where I met Sindor. I mean, isn't it amazing? You go to these different countries and then you meet people from different countries. Um, and we've been firm friends since. And then she sends me this book. I knew she was writing the book. And of course, she set up Barks and we're very involved with that. But I knew she had written this book because she'd asked me a couple of things, but I had no idea of the content. Then I opened it and I found that she'd written a whole lot of stuff about me, which was just incredible. So I'm very lucky that this woman here has introduced me to loads and loads of fantastic people. And Turid asked me, um, or I was asked to talk at Turid's 80th birthday. And I worked out from the people that she'd introduced me to, then I'd gone on to talk at seminars and various other things. And I worked out for her that by her inviting me along, I had managed to talk to, I think it was something like 10,000 people um, because of her, because of her. Um, and it's just an amazing woman, amazing, amazing woman. Um, and we went to India and this is where Hannah, who had then studied um, with us at Gala Maya Therapy, and she came to us with us to India in 2017, something that Sindor arranged. And we had such an incredible time. We really did met amazing dogs, amazing people, did some street work, street dog work. And Hannah and I put together some um, workshops and things. And um, as you can imagine, we spent quite a lot of time in hysterical laughter because it was it was just fantastic um mm -hmm. another colleague came along um Kushla Lehman who's a fantastic garland therapist and also a tutor um she came too and we we did have a very good time so again all this actually is from um Turid or the 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 Sindor connection and then I had a real pinch me moment I still can't believe this has actually happened but I had um, a wonderful email from Professor Daniel Mills earlier this year and said, why don't we meet in Norway and write a book? And, and that's what we are in the process of doing. And it's called, um, this is still a working title, but Discomfort in Dogs. And this is what happened this June. And what a fantastic time. I mean, there were crackles and fireworks between the three of us and just, just incredible. Um, so that, that will be hopefully coming soon. And also in the future, I just thought I'd mention, um, we've got our level five course, which is, um, a rehab course, and it's going to introduce, uh, my version or Garland's version of rehabilitation, which is the six piece, um, in conjunction with functional movement. So we look at rehab in a slightly different way. We look at functional movement, what a dog should be able to do and should do and look at that and take it from that sort of basis, looking at their rehab from, from that perspective. We're also doing CPDs uh, for all paraprofessionals, dog trainers, hydrotherapists, vet nurses and behaviorists. So they're all becoming out and we will let you know when they're, when they're all out there. And that is a few slides that I thought might be, might give a bit of, bit of background to where we sort of, where Garland originated. Joe, I'm exhausted on your behalf. <laughs> <laughs> because what an amazing journey you've been on. And, and I know. You about those ripples earlier. And um, I, I think for me, 
when we think how long we've kind of fussed over, been almost obsessed over what happens after behavior. Yeah. When we turned that telescope round, if you like, and looked mm. through it the other way and thought about what about all the stuff that happens before it? Yeah. That's a richness that um, that Turid and you and Sindor and a lot of other people are really mm. tapping into yeah. and recognizing that it's very rarely a single thing. It is often multifactorial. Absolutely. Um, and, uh, and that's what's so amazing about this. And uh, when's mm. that level five coming out, by the way? Well, we're, we're developing it now. It is going to be um, for my therapists because it runs on from there. And we hope to then also take it to level six. We, This is important that we take it up a level because it is a different way of looking at rehab from a much more, no, that, that sounds awful, from a very natural position. Mm-hmm. I've always been very keen looking at functional movement um, and looking at different planes of movement, how a dog moves through that planes, the hierarchy of those types of movement, when they stop being able to do different types of movement within that, those planes, how do we then gently encourage that movement pattern back? Because we've got to work with the dog as a whole, haven't we? Mm. We really have. We, we don't target a particular area. If they're lame on one leg, we still look at the whole dog because that without doubt is coming from may not be one, but maybe several different positions in the dog so we've got to work with them as a whole but as you say looking back um, from the outcome maybe sometimes as the lameness or a behavior or both looking back and trying to backtrack and look at how these things started and and I think one thing that I've really um, noticed and, and use a lot and we all do is to look at assessing posture because it's it can be almost like looking at um, the lines within a tree, aging a tree. You can actually sometimes with some dogs, not all, but quite a few, you can track where the posture has come from and changed and almost look at cause and effect. And that and, and using that with positive pack, because when you're using choice, a dog will will obviously enjoy a treatment over certain areas but then give you feedback where it is highly um, reactive and uncomfortable and generally the areas they like being worked over are the compensatory areas so you start unwinding from there Um, so using posture with um, choice is a very very powerful potent combination and that's what's so great isn't it because uh, i love how empowering this is because you are supporting caregivers to be able to be doing a lot of it themselves yeah. and that has its huge advantages of course because you know the dog is more likely to allow certain things with the caregiver that mm-hmm. they might not in a in a clinical room or something like yeah. that but also how evidence-based it is for that dog so it's like yeah going to do this what's the feedback going to do this what's the feedback so the dog engages when you talk about the um what's the term used uh um the compensatory things is that because you might see for example a dog a bit kind of uh, altered gait on the hind left but actually it's not about that that's because the dog's been overcompensating there and it's a bit sore but actually the main problem is front right absolutely that um and and it can bounce around because if you're compensating on one diagonal, for instance, that diagonal can become really tired and and over and fatigued. And mm. so then the, the dog has to then go back onto the leg that caused the initial problem. So you've almost got compensation on compensation. So you're really having to strip that back. Um, and the thing is, dogs do lots of things that don't help us interpret them from our perspective for instance they, I mean as you know they don't show pain as we would they don't go oh this is hurting and walk around like that they if they can get oxygen in their lungs and they're okay they'll keep going so they don't demonstrate pain but also their bodies react in a way that makes them look 
can make them look quite healthy. And that's called global mu muscle domination. And that is something that is so often misinterpreted. So the muscles can be overdeveloped because they're trying to stabilize that body and they can be misinterpreted as being, well, look how well muscled that dog is. So it's also looking at symmetry too, because symmetry is whatever the breed, whatever the breed type, they should be symmetrical from every angle. I, I, I mean, a very basic thing is looking at, you should only be able to see two legs at any angle. If you look at them laterally, two legs. If you look at them from the front, two legs, the back, two legs. So it's quite a, an easy way of trying to just assess. It's not foolproof that, but it's a good start to look at the balance of your dog. So that kind of confirmation then of a dog that can walk square, walk kind of opposites rather than yep. pacing. Yeah, uh, that's a rare thing. <laughs> When you think about it, I don't know any other species, maybe maybe horses, I don't know enough about horses, but how much we put pressure and influence on a dog totally. physically. Totally. You know, we, we decide when they go for a walk, the kind of tools oh, and apparatus yeah. that they have to have to go for a walk, the, the floor surfaces that we expect them to do things, the activities we expect them to do. Um, and uh, uh, when we have aches and pains, and I think even in dogs, I think acute pain you know you can see that a bit more easily mm. but the chronic stuff you know we have a bit of a niggle we think oh, i'll have a rest now i'm gonna take a painkiller i'm gonna yep. whatever i'm gonna take it easy tomorrow the dogs aren't afforded that no if we, if we're not aware of it something, when exactly. We aware. exactly and the thing is as you quite rightly say i mean this is not people don't do this intentionally i know that um, and that's why education is so important but all you need to do is look at the length of our legs and the length of a puppy's leg or even a dog even I mean even your um, Saluki there th their legs are not as long as yours I'm sure so our gait our stride length is going to be different so the very moment we take our dogs out puppies or um, mature dogs we're going to be walking at our length of, of, of stride rather than actually going, well, what is their length of stride? So we immediately teach them to trot, not walk. And mm. walking is such an important gait. It is, it, 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 it builds them from the inside out. It, it conditions them. It actually formulates their body in good muscle patterns. If they learn to trot and they just trot, they're working across diagonals and they're not really building their body from the inside out. So walk is such an important gait. And as you said, it, it's something we don't see very much, really. Not a good walk in a dog. And that's important even when we think about just general things like <clears throat> how we receive good oxygen supplies. You know, when hmm. we're when we're moving to an aerobic state, to yep. flipping to an anaerobic yep. state, and how easy that can be, especially for some of the smaller legged dogs, actually, before yep. you know it, even walk, try to catch up with us and walk at our pace, they're already Absolutely. flipping into that less functional oxygen state. Absolutely. So, and especially with the, the smaller dogs too, where maybe some of their conformation is not as robust, as some of the sort of the mid-sized dogs. Um, if they're trotting the whole time, that is not going to help that type of conformation. To help that conformation, where you really need to get those deep muscles stabilizing and holding everything together from the inside out, you need slow movement. So if they're offered a trot the whole time, that is going to be really difficult for them. And this is important when we think about um, some of the things that you've highlighted, slippery falls, chasing balls, mm. uh, cars. I'd like us to look at those uh, individually in a moment, if that's okay, because there's some important points there for us. Yeah. But the important one there, when we think about chasing balls, uh, there's always these debates, isn't there? And, and we had an article out recently, uh, again, kind of in favour of playing fetch and that kind of thing. I think the key thing mm. to bear in mind is, my late mother used to have a saying, which is there's no absolutes, but kindness. Yeah. And I think we should remember, I think what we could change that for us, actually, which mm. is no absolutes, but welfare. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so playing a bit of ball with the dog, if the dog's enjoying it and, this, and they're not having to put a lot of strain on their body and it doesn't take up their whole walk. Why not? Mm. 
But if a dog is going out and the only kind of exercise they're getting potentially is, and I, I live on a beach down here in Torbay and I see it in the winter, especially they're down there. And you can see that that dog's hours walk is actually just chasing and running yep, around. Exactly. And, and the huge pressures that puts on, but also again, it's getting that dog into that anaerobic state, which has an impact upon the oxygen supply to our muscles and our other organs, especially yeah. the tummy, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the hormonal state, the change in hormonal state. Now that's not my, area of expertise but that too everything everything has an impact i mean i have um a saying about equipment actually and it's it's the same really it can be used within this type of exercise too it's not the equipment or the exercise it's how it's done yes and that's the thing and to be aware and that's why education is so important so if people choose to do a particular type of exercise they understand the best way of doing it, the the things to avoid if possible, and and what to do to counter any bad effects. So it's always, um, I mean, I've worked a lot with um, agility dogs and obedience dogs and all of those sporting dogs. And I always say that if, if a dog is spending a lot of time with their head up, make sure that you counter that with doing things with their head down. And also understand that that is a strain on their body. So they're an athlete. So you must look after them like an athlete. So it's countering those strains all the time, but being aware that they are strains on their body. And if we did something like that continuously, a repetitive nature or the repetitive nature is the thing that's going to do the harm. The dog's body is built to jump off and out of a car. They've got all that concussion equipment intrinsic within their anatomy to be able to absorb those jumps. But it's when it's done time and time again. And it's it's those sort of things that sometimes get a bit lost. So sometimes it's almost easier to say, please don't do that because it's difficult to explain the importance or the, the significance of repetitive nature of exercises and the damage that that does that's a really good way to frame it because when you think about a dog's general day mm. there's a ton of stuff that we have no direct input over they're just being yep. crazy and doing the crazy yep. stuff from the dog these are the things that we do have some uh kind of control or at least input in about how they get in and have a car about the flooring they might have at home exactly. um, uh, about uh you know how we use a ball mm. The activities we do, the sports we do, yeah. All, you know, I was um, I was sat out at a, a a function I went to recently. The lady was chatting to me next to me, so because I was kind of eating, I found myself doing this. Yeah, yeah. About ten minutes, and I really started to feel it on my neck, and I thought, I'm only just looking at you, uh, just by over my shoulder, but. Yep. Uh, and I felt it the next day. I just really felt it just from that small amount of time of, of mm. just having my neck. So we all know what that can feel like when our, our bodies just aren't used to that. Our bodies used exactly. to having it and then either shifting around or following exactly. it through. But put you in an excited state when mm. you, you've got the adrenaline arousal, then you won't feel that pain until after. And yes. that is the other thing too. It's that it's that aroused state that I know Turid go, oh, that I've seen so many problems from dogs with that ball chasing scenario. Um mm. and and I know I sometimes just take my guys around the, the local recreational ground because there are some great sniffs there. And we just go for a nice amble around there and they they love to catch up on the local gossip. But there is, as I call, the drug dealer there. And they get out of the car, these two Labradors at the same age of mine, and they just stand with the Chucky. And these dogs are, oh, you can see it in their eyes. And they try and lure my dog over. <laughs> well, she, she sees it and goes, oh, I've got to have a part of that. And it's such a draw because of that excitement. But um, these particular two, their, their bodies do not look good because that, I think, as you were pertaining to earlier, is a sort sum of their exercise every day. Yeah. And this is the thing, this is where it becomes, this is, if we think about it from just a welfare point of view, mm. uh, then the individual dog, you know, that, it becomes a welfare issue. Totally. Uh, 
and I think you know the debates we hear about crates, for example. You know, yes, mm. dogs uh, can be you know they get crated in the car, transport, vets, and that kind of thing. Um, so that's not a problem. And and even at home for a, a bit of a small time, it's not the end of the world. No, it's safety a, first, you know, isn't it? Safety, safety first. first. But if you've got a dog in there, the reality is if you've got a dog in there at hours on end who can't get up, can't stretch, can't move, it can become a welfare issue. And I think exactly. that's how we need to start pitching our education on these things. Yep. It's not about absolutes. It's just about recognizing the welfare implications, especially for movement. I've got some great uh, footage that I shared in my tourist group, actually, of Molly when she was younger. Mm. The puppy cam. Uh, our spare room just became full because we kept puppy proofing everything. It's like, put it, put it in the spare yep. room, put it in the spare yep. room. But it was interesting. We we had all the timestamps on the on the puppy cam, uh, and she moved four times in a twenty minute period, and to different surfaces. Right. It was just fascinating to see that. Yeah. She had a need to do that, and she couldn't have done that if she'd have been in a in a small crate. No, exactly. Because they loved that. You want your puppy and your dog to be curious, don't you? You want them to explore. You want them to be. Um, they want them to challenge themselves from a physical and emotional and psychological perspective but you don't want to over challenge them so to offer them things for them to walk over walk round walk through walk whichever way and different different gradients is so good it's so good and and i watched i've watched puppies a lot and i love the way that they like to challenge themselves. And then you see the different characters and personalities coming out too, when the braver ones and the not so brave ones. But yeah, absolutely. So what's happening then? So let's just think about jumping out of a car then, just from a, a physiological point of view, because mm. I don't know, I know I know little bits. I think mm. that's the best way to describe my knowledge more generally, actually. I, I know little bits and I kind of somehow managed to put them together. Um, but. I know that the the bulk of the dog's weight organs yeah. weight everything else is on the front. Yeah, but they have more shock absorption through the front, which is mm -hmm. another reason, I guess, when you throw balls and the dog jumps in the air and lands on their back yeah. legs. Often they do. <clears throat> that becomes more problematic because the back end doesn't have the same shock absorption. Not the same infrastructure, no. But you still have a lot of weight coming down on those. Mm. Uh, and anything from, uh, I'm guessing, from more than just a kind of a few inches high just starts to almost exponentially put pressure on that. Exactly. Well, they, they've got free moving forelimbs. I mean, that's a hot, they, they, it's not connected by bone like we, I mean, because we don't, they, they don't need to hold their arms out here and have, hold weights. They're, they, they've got a, a limited range of movement from that perspective. So they've got free flowing forelimbs. So it's just attached by myofascial connections. Um, and also they've got these amazing recoils on their wrists that actually hyperextend when they land. And also that helps with the concussion of landing, but also then the propulsion forwards. So it's an mm -hmm. incredibly, it's amazing design for them to be able to jump down effectively, absorb all that load without going into the neck. But if they do it repetitively, you're going to get small bits of damage here bits of damage there if they're a bit sore on one leg they're going to then um predominantly land on the other leg then it starts to travel into their neck then they land like this and then more more issues with their neck and then it goes down their back so mm. muscle damage does not get better on its own it needs to be treated resting mm. muscles are good but they need treatment too because it's a bit like if you fracture a bone, it's, it's, it's a bit, this is a stretch, but mm. if you fracture a bone and just leave it, it will, it will be sort of, let me get my arms right, like that. And it's very like mm. muscle fibers. We need to sort of realign them through treatment to allow a good functional scarring. So that's the other thing. It's trying to teach people because it's muscles you we haven't got a very effective diagnostics or not cheap diagnostics or cheaper so we can't x-ray them and i think that's why they've been always a poor relation um mm. to obviously the, the 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 skeletal side so we need to also educate that if dogs do have an injury even if they don't fracture something they could do a lot of damage to their soft tissue and it needs looking at by a specialist and that's important as well, isn't it? Because I think 
especially from uh, the clinical teams around dogs. A lot of vets, not all, but many have a quite an orthopedic bias yeah, because that's they do. what they can or neurological too. And it's easy to get it's easy to get an evidential basis back on that because mm. you can do a, an imaging on that. Yeah. Uh, neuropathic side of things um, can be a bit more, especially the myofascial side of things, can be more mm. a lot more nuanced and yeah. uh, and tricky to look at. And also, when you were saying about dogs jumping out the boot, what you referenced earlier is is, is relevant there, isn't it? Because of the often the dog might not like traveling in the car, so they're already mm. tense, mm. Um, uh, uh, or that they're real excited and they're already in a very fizzy state when they leap out. All these things have a knock on effect, don't they? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think um, from my perspective, obviously, again, the old tunnel vision is out there, but um, the myofascial side of things is, is underestimated at how powerful and strong it is and needed to be balanced to be able to keep the body in some sort of balanced state. And an, an example of that is actually my example, um, not very long ago, sadly, I had to go into hospital and I had to had a bit of an accident and had an x-ray. And the x-ray was my sort of thoracic lumbar region. And um, I went back for the consult after they'd seen the x-ray. And she said, oh, I've got the wrong x-ray. This isn't you. I said, what do you mean? She said, no, this person's got the scoliosis. You haven't got a scoliosis. Or have you? I went, yeah. She said, well, your posture is really good. I said, I work hard on it. Yeah. Um, so really, I mean, I should be really twisted and if I allowed that to take place so working constantly to try and maintain balance is really important because your myofascial connections actually can hold your body in a good balanced way and the thing is with these wonderful diagnostics we get and, and they are amazing but sometimes they can be seen something could be seen that go oh there's a problem there it is but actually it can be helped by balancing the dog from a myofascial perspective and even for us because there's a lot of therapies and uh supportive methods uh for us about if you mm. improve posture if you improve balance actually <laughs> improves your it improves your uh, emotional health and mental health because Absolutely. you know everything is connected in that way i think that's, okay that's, mm. When we think about the slippery floor side of things, it's a big one, isn't it? And I know, um, uh, uh, what is it that, what's the cam saying more? Less drugs, more rugs. Less drugs. Or more, more rugs, rugs, more drugs. Yeah, yeah that's right. Um, less, less, more rugs, less drugs, yes. It's a relatively new phenomenon, isn't it? I guess, because we, we're all, you know, especially in the UK, we are obsessed with our carpets going back and mm. going back a lot. Um, and I, I know at our, exactly. at our home, we uh, we have all dog friendly flooring, and as far as it, as in it's easy to clear up. But exactly. We do have we do have rugs everywhere, especially those those places where they're likely to go whizzing around corners yeah. and that kind of thing. Yeah. And you can see in them, you can see when they get excited that all those legs are starting to go Bambi like, aren't they? And that's Absolutely. Kind of, do you think slippery floors is probably out of the three things, the big one and the Biggie. one that we, huge, huge. Yeah especially with puppies. I mean, you still see videos now of people putting up on YouTube, go, oh, look at this, look at this, isn't this hilarious? And this puppy is going everywhere on the floor. Um, and that puppy is trying to develop not just the skeletal structure, but all those, again, back to the old myofascial connections, neurology, all these pathways are meant to be put together in a dog that's walking and moving in an anatomically true um, shape, if you like. And mm. when they're getting that amount of damage to the underside of them. So when you look at the dog's hind legs, they've got muscles medially and laterally. So the inside thigh and their outside thigh. If the inside is damaged, then the outside thigh is actually then struggling to try and stabilize that hip. And that's when they can really get some very serious muscle domination. And they look like they're really well muscled, but there's no muscle inside their thigh. So they mm. become very, very unbalanced. And that can be from slippery floors. 
And then if you add in onto that being put into a harness or whatever they're being walked and the kind of walks they have, exactly, you're building up a problem already, aren't you? Aren't you you really are. You really are. And and what really upsets all of us is that we hear a lot, oh, well, they're eight, they're old. They're not. They're just a little bit creaky. And eight is not old. I, I, um, I think we should sometimes play sort of top trumps of breeds and age and I had uh, a 15 a 15 year old Newfoundland so uh, uh, yeah. yeah um but eight is not old and mm. that is another part of the education that would be nice to come through that I mean really we should I know some breeds there are certain issues which is very sad but we should be looking at at least 12 um, and thinking, yeah, we we need to have our dogs until they're that age because it takes it takes that long, I think, for us to really just be one. So it's also interesting to see how many puppy classes are done on slippery village hall floors, and that's a great opportunity for anybody who's listening in, who's a trainer and uh, hasn't maybe considered this. Mm. to put down those mats and say we're putting the mats down because uh, and it's a great way to bring that up so people can adopt it the same at home exactly and i think this is where we need to invite a change in in puppy classes and, and dog training mm. classes where exactly. not just having the functional teaching stuff but mm. as the opportunity to give people basic information this stuff that we're Very talking much. about yeah could be forming part of every puppy class exactly exactly yeah absolutely or, or, or even give them my book as well. I was just going to say, I was, I was bringing that segue in. <laughs> nice plug there. But, yeah. but I think really, Andy, the, the big thing is, is that if we just go back and think about what would a dog be, what surface would a dog be on if they weren't living with us, if they were in their natural environment, what would a puppy be doing to develop in a natural environment? If we just go back, even to that sort of basics, then it gives us a really good idea as to what we need to be giving to our puppies and our dogs, because that's what their anatomy is built for. Um, and that's what we've sort of got to go and, yeah, okay, flooring's great for us. We walk around and we can put non-slip shoes on um, and steps are fine for us too, because we, we walk on our long legs. But if we just look at what how a dog's body's built and what they were built to do, we won't go far wrong. No. And that's the irony, is it? I think for the general public, a lot, there's so much misinformation out there and, mm. and much of it's like 30 years out of date, if you're lucky. Yes. So, so on the one hand, they're thinking, oh, I can't take my dog out for long walks. Whereas, in fact, we know the puppy will be great just mooching around. That'll be Absolutely. fine. Absolutely, yeah. So they Definitely. don't go out much out there where they do have surfaces that they can learn to connect to. and, and exactly. Come and exactly. But in the home, it's a free-for-all and they're slipping and sliding and being alone. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah, your book, um, uh, which is a brilliant book, I've read it, and um, uh, uh, is How to Build a Puppy. Uh, how to Build a Puppy. Um, I'm going to say, uh, what's the second bit? Into a, Into healthy, a healthy, mature dog, yeah. How to Build a Puppy into a Healthy adult dog highly recommend it we'll make sure we put a link in with um things with this talk thank you so well that's flown by i i, I think it's a it's a real honor to talk to you you'd have to say oh, it's, well it's, it's, really, it's my honor to be invited to talk to be taught so thank you well i'm really excited about the joint um collaboration with with daniel and um and turid so exciting. Uh, that's really exciting there's a lot of exciting things coming up for sure and, and we must make sure you know, Dog Centre Care, I'll make sure that uh, you and Gail in my therapy as a page uh, are on on pre-approved for the group. So Thank please you. share it to you in the group. I think it's really important. What can we leave people with, uh, Julia? What, what words of wisdom would you like to kind of make sure that we impart before we finish? Wow. Um, OK, give me give me some sort of steerage because we talked about the slippery floors. I think that is for, mm -hmm. is that the sort of thing you mean? That, well, that anything you feel that you would like people to really take away, whether it's about um, you know, spending some time to look at their dog's movement. Maybe I, I was going to I was just going to say that you're absolutely right. I think just observe your dogs and and their behaviour. Things that I think are very interesting. Oh, I know a really good one that we do recommend is that 
if you've had your dog from a puppy or even when you first rehome them because you wonderful people rehoming dogs if you've got a picture of them especially a side view put it on the fridge and then look at your dog now and see if their posture has changed and mm. that would be a really good indication because postural change is insidious it it, it happens so slowly and without mm. real warning and a couple of things that are really interesting is that often when a posture does change the tail action changes and the tail position can change and the head position can change so if you get an old picture of your dog put it on the fridge or somewhere where you can look and then compare with how your dog is looking um, and that will give you a really good indication of their physical health amazing well, uh, where can people find more than Julia? Well, we have our website, which is galamyotherapy.com. There's everything there. If you want to chat with anyone, just go on the chat version and say, Oi, I want to talk to someone. Um, <laughs> and we're, we, we are, I mean, it's not getting us to talk. It's, I think I said to you before, it's getting us to stop talking is the biggest issue. If anyone wants to ask any questions, please come to us and ask. Um, if anyone's interested in the distance support, that's on the, the site too. Um, I mean, really just have a look at the website and, and see what you see what you think. And as I said, any comments are most welcome. And for professionals, because I'm really, I've, I've, I'm, I've, my juices are flowing now. <laughs> uh, I'm very interested. And uh, so for the behaviourists and trainers out there and, and groomers as well and that's, anybody. Yeah. Uh, yeah. especially groomers I think because they actually get to see the dog more than anybody often and they're the ones Absolutely. who can pick up on things uh what's a good kind of introductory course that you might offer to get give people a flavor and uh, and, and learn some of these things right it's very kind of you to ask this so we, we've got some really lovely online courses on um assessing and uh, massage of the dog of movement and soft tissue repair and so we've got those and also a very very good first aid one that's actually being presented by a vet but if yeah. anyone's in, interested in their own professionalism to learn more about posture and the discomfort and the behavior to go with it, we're actually running paraprofessional CPDs and we've just started to launch these. So if anyone's yeah. interested, so we're doing them very specifically for hydrotherapists, very specifically for vet nurses, very specifically for dog trainers and also for behaviorists. So it is you either can come as a group or you can come as part of a group and it's it's zoom training so it's two three hour sessions and what we like to do is work with case histories of your own to make it very very specific yeah. um we do it zoom because i know we're all zoomed but um it does enable people to get some some training without the expense of having to leave and we're all trying to save money aren't we amazing Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Julie. That's uh, what, a, what a brilliant evening. And we've had some lovely comments in there. Oh, group. that's really lovely. We really appreciate the time and, and your generosity. And, and I think that's oh. that's one thing I think uh, that I picked up from you is just how generous you are about this. And, and it's you. a gift, I think, to, to keep sharing. Well, thank you, everybody. Just to let you know what's coming up. Um, we've got Ian and Dominique coming in on Wednesday a little bit later because they're coming in from Australia. And they're getting up at like five o'clock in the morning, bless them, uh, to share their care model, which is amazing. Uh, then um, on the 24th, we've got uh, Roman, Roman Gottfried coming back again uh, to talk about um, uh, parenting and trauma, which is going to be really fascinating. Um, then on the 26th, we've got Mish, Mish Masters coming in. Um, uh, Mish is going to be sharing with us about working with um, foreign rescue dogs. Uh, we've also then got Jack Fenton returning as well. He's going to be coming to talk about um, a care approach with, with kind of dog training. So there's quite a few things coming up. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, everybody, for tuning lovely, in. Lovely, Andy. Thank you very much indeed. It's lovely to talk to you. Lovely to talk to you as well, Julia. It's been a real treat. Uh, thank you, everybody. You take care. Stay safe. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.